uh, the prophet Isaiah. We've read through the first 48 chapters. Believe that we've been through 48 chapters of Isaiah already. And so, um, and what a blessing as we were, as we have been studying the prophet Isaiah, there's certain things I just always go over, as you know, before we get started, just as foundational things, as we're studying the book of Isaiah, um, Isaiah is a prophet. And we know that prophecy is primarily given for who? Who is, the Bible says, who is prophecy, who is prophecy primarily given for? Who is the prophecy for? According to the Bible. Testing you. Who is the prophecy for, brothers and sisters? Who's, who's prophecy given for? The servants of the Most High. That's right. Remember what Revelation says. That's right, Israel. Is it, remember what the, what, the, what, the, what the Bible says in the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So prophecy is given for the servants of the Most High. The majority of the folks on planet Earth won't believe prophecy because it's not for them. Okay, uh, They'll believe whatever the deceiver is bringing them. The Bible showed us that the deceiver and his girlfriend, Rome, deceived the whole world into worshiping them. And they don't even realize what they're doing. So just so prophecy is showing us his servants what is getting ready to happen. What is getting ready to happen. It will come as a surprise to the majority of planet Earth, but it will not come as a surprise to the servants of the Most High because that's what prophecy is for. He's showing us what's coming. Also, all prophecy points to who? All prophecy has has is, is pointing to who? All prophecies pointing to what and who? That's right. All prophecy points to Christ, whom the Bible calls Jesus, whose Hebrew name is Yahweh whose Hebrew name is Yahweh Mashiach. But in English, they call him Jesus Christ. So all prophecy is pointing to him. Okay, all prophecies point to him. He is the centerpiece of prophecy because it's going to be his kingdom. The earth is going to be his kingdom. The people that are redeemed upon it are going to be the inhabitants of his kingdom. So all prophecy has something to do with him. What else does all prophecy has something to do with? Christ and what else? Give, give me some other stuff. What else does prophecy point to? All prophecy has what? All prophecy has, aside from pointing to Christ, that's right, that, what is to come? That's true. That's that's the, the show of service. That's right. Past, present, and future. That's right. And so all prophecy, can I say it this way? You guys are all correct. All prophecy has end time implications. Can I say that? All prophecy has end time implications. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. All prophecy. Now they might have have local applications or things that have end time living in the end time. Does that make sense? So it has to do end time implications. It has to people it has to do with Christ and it has to do with people that are living in the end time. So so that when you're looking at prophecy and we're in the end time, you're looking at us and people that are going to be ahead of us, people that are not that, that we don't know yet, that are that are going to get knowledge and we don't even know them yet but they're going to get more knowledge than us and they're coming after us and so it's talking about us and them also we know as a basis thing that the bible does not contradict itself right we know that the bible does not contradict itself everybody got that testing one two three there are people that would argue about different points of the Bible and try to actually, without saying it, try to imply that the Bible contradicts itself. The Bible does not contradict itself. If there is a misunderstanding in the Bible, the problem is with the reader. It's not with the Bible. The Bible does not contradict without itself. Saying, Everybody can hear me. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. You got that? Okay. Okay. okay, so the okay. Bible does so the Bible not, uh, not contradict itself. Uh, also, also, the Bible says, the Bible about, says itself about itself that in the mouth, that of, in the two mouth or of two or three witnesses, witnesses every word be established. Doesn't it say that? In the mouth of two or three witnesses. Now, that is why when we go to when we go to look at a doctrine in the Bible, you must have more than one verse. In the mouth of two 
or three witnesses, right? So you got to have more than one verse to talk about a doctrine of the Bible. So somebody will say, well, you know, Sunday's now the Sabbath. Well, give me two or three scriptures that show that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday. Most people can't even find one because it doesn't exist. You understand what I'm saying? So there's at least two or three verses to substantiate any truth that's in the Bible. It's not just one person. So that Isaiah is saying something, you can probably find the same thing. We've seen it already in Jeremiah. You can see the same thing in Ezekiel. You can see the same thing in the Psalms. You can see the same thing in Deuteronomy. You can see the same thing in Zephaniah, in Hosea, in Daniel, in Revelation, in Peter, in different places, right? So you had so yeah, the mouth of two. Most of the time, there's many more than two or three witnesses. There's a cloud of witnesses, but the, in the mouth of two. So that when we have a doctrine from the Bible, we have it from more than one place. This prevents people from taking one verse and making an entire doctrine out of it, which is what a lot of people do. So the Bible gives us a built-in protection from that, okay? So, so these are the basic things that we know as we are the prophecies of Isaiah. The last time we looked at Isaiah, we were looking at Isaiah 48, and the Bible was showing us the Most High was, was basically calling out his people who were, who were saying they were his people, but were not following him in truth or in righteousness. They were not following him in truth and in righteousness. He was telling them who he is as the creator of all things. He was also causing us to understand the judgment he was bringing or is going to bring on, on that was first under Nimrod, then Nebuchadnezzar, before it was taken down under Belshazzar. But now we know about modern Babylon, which we know from, is headed by who? Who is the head of modern Babylon? According to, as we studied from Isaiah 48 and other places, we looked at Daniel, we looked who is the head of Mark? That's right, it is Rome. The head of modern Babylon is definitely Revelation and Daniel last week. And the week before that, we studied it. Rome is the head. Now, the thing about Rome being the head of modern Babylon is most people have no idea <laughs> that this is the case. Most people, if you ask them, they have no idea that this is the case. Or if they do, they can't show it from the Bible. See, this is one of those things you have to be able to go into the Bible and show because nobody will believe you if you say, well, you know, that man that flies around his private jet in a white suit and, and smiles real nice and says love to everybody and puts the cross sign. He is antichrist. N nobody would believe that, okay? Especially the one billion people that call themselves Roman Catholics. They won't believe you. So you have to know from the scriptures. Again, this is why we say prophecy is something that the servants of the Most High know. So when things are going on in the planet, we know what's going on because we understand who's behind it. Most of the world has no idea, okay? The Bible did show us that the, the great whore operates in secret. The Bible says she was in a desolate place in the wilderness. So she operates in secret, okay? The Bible says she operates in by craft. She deceives men. So nobody knows that she's behind all the drug wars. She's behind the pharmaceutical industry, the Hollywood industry, the political industry. She's behind the one world government. She's behind secret societies. She's behind all the wars that are done upon the earth. She's behind all of it. But nobody knows that because they don't know these prophecies, right? But we know. Okay. Now in Isaiah 49, the Most High is going to show us him redeeming his people. Okay. Him redeeming his people. Yes, he has a bulletproof car because, you know, they somebody shot the, one of the popes back in the, I believe it was the 70s. It might have been the 80s. Uh, one of the popes was shot. At close, and it was it was it was shown by some that it was a staged shooting, and so um, in fact it was shown by a Jesuit priest. A Jesuit priest. Was see the most high deliver his people can you all hear me testing one two three can you all hear me and remember if you cannot hear remember we're on youtube and let me put the channel up there 
So there's the YouTube channel, right? So there's the YouTube channel. Um, if you have trouble hearing, you can mute this one and get that on the YouTube channel. You can hear it pretty clear over there. Um, aside from, from video uh, taping this, this segment, it's good for the sound because we have sound problems from Proud Talk pretty often. So in Isaiah 49, we're going to see some wonderful promises. <coughs> also, how he's going to redeem his people and for his on the earth. And the scripture says, listen unto me, and hearken, ye people. Yahweh hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hath hid me. He hath made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he hath hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel in whom I will be glorified. All right, let's stop. Let's stop right here for a moment. I lost something. I, I lost. I don't know how I lost the microphone. Uh, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Testing, one, two, three. I lost the microphone somehow. Okay. Okay. So the Bible, is, it says to us here from Isaiah chapter one, from verses one to three, the Most High is saying, in verse three, he said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Let me ask you a dumb question. Who is he talking about in the first three verses when he says, I have called you from the womb. May, I've made mention of your name. Okay, who is he talking about? And, you, and his mouth is like a sharp sword. Who is he dealing with here? And then he says, and said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel in whom I will be glorified. Who is he talking about? No, no, he, he's talking by the Holy Spirit, but who is he talking about when he talked about his servant? Remember now, all prophecy deals with Christ, right? <laughs> yep, it deals with Christ and it deals with his people. So he's talking about Christ and he's talking about Israel. You guys follow that? In fact, in verse three, he says, thou art my servant, O Israel. You got that? So he's talking about the Most High, he's talking about his son, the Messiah, and he's talking about his people who he calls Israel. Everybody got that? Testing one, two, three. So he's talking about the Messiah and he's talking about Israel because he says it right there. And thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So now, this is also a prophecy. He says he will be glorified in Israel. Christ will be glorified in Israel. How, what does that mean? Well, let's think about this for a second. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, Thou, He hath made him, that is, the Father hath made Christ, or Messiah, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Yah in him now what does that mean it's the same thing pretty much he's saying the same way so in other words through christ through the messiah we become righteousness hmm? that's powerful isn't it so through the messiah we are made the righteousness of the most high okay it's it's it's, it's simple and yet many people don't know what i just said many people don't ever know what i just said we become righteousness in him yeah so that when the father looks upon us he is looking upon us through the righteousness of his son the righteousness of the messiah covers the repentant sinner testing one two three everybody got that so when we come to the messiah we plead his blood to have to be cleansed from all our sin cleanses us from all sin and we receive from him perfect 
righteousness. We could not earn it. We could not develop it. It's given to us as a gift, and that's called grace. Perfect righteousness. So we become perfect righteousness in the Messiah. That spirit of righteousness is more than just a theory. It's the spirit. That spirit that we receive causes us to be obedient to all his commandments. This week, I was talking to a lady at the bank. And this lady, you know, was very proud to tell me that she spent uh, almost all of her money going to Colorado to Bible school. Okay. She went to Colorado to Bible school and she was so glad she went to Colorado to go to Bible school. I think she said she spent a year there or something like that. And she told me that she, you know, she knew Jesus. Okay. So we started talking and somehow I mentioned the Sabbath. She said, oh, that's all done away with. She said, that's all done away with in the new covenant. So then I said to her, can you please, of course, she wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise. She was talking so much, but in, in the midst of it, I said, can you please tell me from the Bible, what is the new covenant? What does the Bible say the new covenant is? And she kind of made something up because as most people, they don't read the Bible. I don't know why she went to a Bible college. They don't really read the Bible. So she couldn't tell me. She, she meant some of, she said, well, you know what Jesus did and, uh, and he changed things and he made it for everybody to be saved. And I said, no, that's not what the Bible says the new covenant is. And so I said, let me, can I tell you what this actually says? And you can look it up in your Bible. And she said, okay. So I proceeded to quote from Hebrews chapter eight, what the new Bible, what the new covenant is. And I said, did you notice what I said? She said, it doesn't say that. I said, actually it does look it up. And she knew it did, but she couldn't, because I stressed, I said, the new covenant, the Bible says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I said, so the new covenant is with Israel and Judah. And she said, no, it's not. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you look it up and you can see it for yourself. Right? So he, the most high has given his righteousness as a perfect covering for Israel. Now, we're going to see later on in Isaiah 49. He's also going to save Gentiles as well. But his primary reason is to establish a nation called Israel, a nation that is now, as we read in Isaiah, a nation that is now scattered. Okay, a nation that is scattered. Why are Israelites scattered? Why does the Bible say they have been scattered? Why are they scattered? What does the Bible say? Why are the Israelites scattered? People think uh, that's right. They have been cursed for not keeping his commandments. Exactly, Castro. That's exactly right. They have been cursed for not obeying his commandments. And in fact, the Bible shows us in 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter wrote uh a uh epistle and it, the epistle is titled first peter because he wrote two right but i want you to notice who the epistle is for first peter chapter one and verse one and verse two notice what the scripture says that the epistle was written for you see paul would write epistle to the romans or to the thessalonians or to the colossians well who are these this first peter who was it written for notice what it says Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, that's our Father Yah, Abba, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Yahweh Shai, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So this is through the strangers scattered. Okay, wait a minute. There's another one. James also has a letter, an epistle that he wrote. And, and notice, this is going to make it even clearer. James chapter 1, verse 1. James chapter 1, verse 4. Thank you, Sister Elaine. James chapter 1, verse 1. Notice what it says. James, a servant of Yah, or God, and of the Lord Yahweh Christ, to who? The 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. See that? So the Israelites have been scattered for a long time. They've been scattered for a long time. He's going to gather them again, but he's scattered them. So now when he says, I'm going to be glorified in Israel, this is surely prophecy. 
because he's saying, I'm going to gather them together and I'm going to bring glow. I'm going to be glorified in them. Just like we are in Christ in righteousness, we are in him in glory. He's going to be glorified in them. How? Because they will perfectly reflect his righteousness that he gave them. They will, they will, they will perfectly reflect his perfect character. They will do that by receiving that righteousness which he offers as a gift. And that's brothers and sisters, this is the big difference between those who will be redeemed at these last days of earth's histories and those who will not. The people who are not redeemed fail in two areas. They fail in repentance and they fail in the reception of perfect righteousness. Most churches, and tell me if I'm wrong, most churches are teaching you cannot obtain perfection. Is that correct? Most churches teach, in fact, I've never, I don't think I've heard a church teach that you can receive perfection. Uh -huh. So when I told the woman that went to the Bible college, when, she, when I asked her and she couldn't tell me what new covenant was, and then she was, she was uh, telling me, you know, no, 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 the Bible doesn't say that. I said, actually, if you look at it, it does say that. And then she kind of knew it did. So then she said, well, you can't keep the commandments. I said, yes, you can. And then she said, do you keep the commandments? I said, yes, I do. She said, how do you do that? How do you keep the commandments? We're all born in sin. That's what she said. So I said, okay, we are all born in sin. But do you know what the gospel says? And then she said, well, Jesus died for us. I said, that's only part of the gospel. That's only part of the gospel. I said, most people only get the part that you just said. They don't have the other part, which is why they struggle with sin. The other part of the gospel, there's two parts. The first part is, yes, Christ died for mm -hmm. our sins. And if we confess our sins, what does the Bible say? Mm -hmm. If you confess your mm -hmm. sins, mm -hmm. he is what? He is faithful and just mm -hmm. to forgive you your sins and to mm -hmm. do what? To do what? Mm -hmm. What does he do for us? First John mm -hmm. chapter yes. one. What does he do for us? What does he do? First John chapter one, verse nine and 10. Notice what it says. First John chapter one, verse nine and 10. Let's read it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So how much unrighteousness does he cleanse us from according to the scripture? All, all, which means when you have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, there's no more sin on you. Testing one, two, three. Are you catching that? There's no more sin on you because he has cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Okay. All right. So now that's the first part. The second part is we received a gift from him. Right. We received a gift from him. Uh, aside from forgiveness of sin. Can you all hear me? Sister Mercy, you can't. Testing one, two, three. Can you all hear? Okay. We receive a gift from him, and the gift is the righteousness of Father, right? Why, why, why do I, where do I get that from? Well, let's look at the scriptures. This is in several places. I'm going to just show you maybe two of them right now, just for the sake of time, because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So let's look first at, at Philippians, Philippians chapter three, Philippians chapter three. Let's look at that first. Philippians chapter 3. Notice what the scripture says. Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to read from verse, let's see. You got to read this carefully because people skip over it real fast and they miss it. But Philippians chapter 3. Um, let's, for the sake of context, let's read from verse 3 down to verse 9. Philippians chapter 3, and the focus of what we're talking about is in verse 9, but I would like to read from verse 3 just for, you know, we like to read in context. So, for we are the circumcision which worship Yah in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Yahweh and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrew, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, 
blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now watch this. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. What does it say? The righteousness which is of God, or Yah, by faith. So the faith of Christ is the righteousness of the Most High. Does that make sense? So he gives us, as a gift, perfect righteousness. Okay? So we are, we are cleansed from all our sin by confessing. And by faith we receive the spirit of perfect righteousness. This is what gives us power to overcome all sin. Testing one, two, three. You got that so far? I got to get you another witness, though. You got that so far? Testing one, two, three. Okay. Very good. Let us continue then. Let's look at Romans. Let's look at Romans. Let's see. Which one do I? Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. Let's see. Yes. Romans chapter three. Uh, again, for the sake of context, let's look at from verse 19 down to verse, uh, let's see, down to verse 25, okay? Verse 19 down to verse 25, the emphasis is on 22, okay? Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped and all the world may become guilty before Yah. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of Yah without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even, here it is, the righteousness of Yah, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That is the faith of Jesus, the Most High's righteousness. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of Yah being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Yahweh Shai, whom Yah has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood and to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of Yah. Now, what does all that mean? By faith, we receive perfect righteousness. We're talking about being justified here, okay? Justification. Most people can Use this. Oh, the law is done away with. That is not what this scripture is saying. What it's saying is you can't be justified or declared innocent by anything you have you do subsequently after you have sinned. Okay. Once you have sinned, or you are you are then a sinner, and there's nothing you can do to make yourself innocent from sin. Okay? So the word justify means to be declared innocent, to be guiltless. So we can't make ourselves innocent after we have sinned. So the covenant, the Ten Commandments, is broken by all of us. And we can't do sin. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sin, it shall die. Ezekiel 18, verse 3. Or 8, 4. I'm sorry, 18, 4. So the soul that sins, it shall die. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory. So what happens? The Most High sends his son, the Mashiach, to pay the penalty of sin. That whoever believes him and trusts in him and confesses sin will have all their sin forgiven and receive perfect righteousness, which you could not earn. So now you are just innocent, not because you have done things, but because you have received the lamb. See? So now you have received him. And now you have perfect righteousness. So now he is telling us in Isaiah 49. That he's going to redeem his people Israel through perfect righteousness. Does that make sense? This brother is going to be glorified. Or he's going to redeem his people through perfect righteousness. The righteousness, his own righteousness through his son. Giving of that righteousness by the Messiah is a word called what? I'm testing you now. 
What does it mean? What is that one word that, that represents the, the offering of righteousness to us who don't deserve it? What is that word called? When through the Messiah, he gives us perfect righteousness. What is that word? What is it called? You guys know what it is. Uh, that's it. That's the word I was looking for. Grace. That is called, that is the receiving of perfection that you did not earn. Now, it is sanctification say that's wrong but it because but but grace encompasses being justified and being sanctified okay it encompasses both so grace is what we receive through the messiah that causes us to be cleansed from all our sin and to receive perfect righteousness and that righteousness comes through grace by the power what is the power that the most high uses for us this grace what is the power that he uses to call this grace? What is that power called? Can somebody tell me? What is that power called? That call That's right. It is the power of the Holy Ghost. So through the Holy Ghost, we receive forgiveness of sins. Through the Holy Ghost, we receive perfect righteousness. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. So now Israel is going to be redeemed in perfect righteousness. That's why the Bible in Revelation says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Yah and have the faith of That's why it's very important that we say faith of Christ, not faith in Christ, as many Bible versions say. They lose the whole point when they say faith in Christ. Faith of Christ is the perfect righteousness that we receive. Without that righteousness, we could not make it. When I told that woman at the bank what I just told you, she said, he was arguing, wouldn't let me talk until I said that. Then she said, that's the truth. <laughs> I said, yes, it is. Because she said, I said, and that's how I am obedient to the commandments of the most high. She said, that makes sense. She said, in that regard, I understand. I said, yeah. I said, we receive perfection because Christ is perfect. She said, oh, yes, he is. I said, his spirit is perfect. She said, yes, it is. We receive. That's what it is. It's not ours, like in terms of of us. It's not of us. It's of Him. But it's but He gives it to us, and we praise the Most High. He covers us with it. That's why we're accepted by the Father. Without that righteousness, we would not be accepted by the Father. We would not be accepted. Okay. So in in, in perfect righteousness, we are accepted by the Father because then in perfect righteousness. Okay. And so that is tough on people who true gospel and that's why the devil works so hard to pervert the true gospel so that is not being taught in these denominations is not being taught to the people and the people if at best they like that lady with half gospel and they they have no power over their sin there's no power over sin okay okay so it's it's yeah it's filthy rags it's right it's there's no power over their sin so they get half of it so the half of it just produces a good feeling for a few moments and then you back to suffering again back to struggling with the same old sins year after year after year okay whereas the true gospel the bible says is the power of yah unto salvation so it breaks the chains of sin as christ said you shall be free indeed. Praise the Most High. So he's saying, Isaiah is saying he's going to be the most in Israel. Or Israel is going to be glorified. He says, I'm going to be glor in whom I will be glorified. So his righteousness is going to be shown in his Israelite people. Okay. His righteousness is going to be shown in his Israelite people. That is, again, at the end of time where we live. Can you tell me who are people upon whom perfect righteousness will be through the spirit who are these people what does the bible call them you remember what does the bible call these people that's right they're the remnant give me some more that's right they are they are the remnant what else are they, they are associated right now they're associated in numerical form <laughs> i'm gonna say it like that they're associated in numerical form who are they? That's right. The 144,000. That's exactly right. The 144,000. They are going to be glorified by wearing the perfect righteousness of Yahweh Shai. They're going to be wearing that righteousness and it will be seen. 
their face will be aglow with the righteousness. Their words will be filled with power of conviction. Okay, power of conviction. And so, uh, praise the Most High. So we're dealing with, no, it's not a denomination. It's a people. And in fact, if you were going to name them, you'd have to name them Israel because the Bible says very plainly they are what? There are 12 tribes. There are 12 tribes of Israel. Doesn't it say that? Revelation chapter 7. It says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, uh, until we have sealed the servants of our God or our, our Alayim in their foreheads. And he says, it says, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there was sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of what? Of all the tribes of the children of Israel. That's what we're dealing with. So nowhere in the Bible does it ever mention a denomination, but constantly it mentions a nation. Constantly. Okay? It constantly mentions Israel. Constantly. Now, let me, again, yes, just the 12 gauge, you brought up a good point. Let me make sure I am clear. When the Bible is talking about Israel, it is.